and we're live great <laughs> good to have you here chungi um let's see i actually saw you on rebecca's story last night when did you s- pick up a camera and become a second shooter oh uh as soon as i i wouldn't say as soon as i got married but uh i yeah obviously because she does shooting and she asked me to help once and then since then i've been working for free for all the rest of the jobs so how many projects have you done so far i think i've been a part of around sorry for the airplane noise um i've been a part of i would say like maybe five or seven weddings uh, uh, definitely a lot more um i would say five to seven weddings but then other projects i would say more so you've done both photo and video work yeah i've done video we actually just did a video. What was that video on? Wedding. What has been your favorite project so far and what has been your least favorite project and why? Uh, it's hard to say what my least favorite project is uh, because I honestly liked all of them. I'm not going to say all weddings were uh, like f- fully prepared and organized, uh, but even those have its own charm, right? So like it's not about everything going perfect it's about you know the stories that come out of it and just the experience and so um but my favorite one i would say my my favorite project both of them have been weddings and then one of them was um i don't know if i could say the name anyway like I, i had this couple and you could just tell that within the wedding there was just this like incredible vibe um within the couple and then everyone else who like love and cares for them. There was just like, it was just a beautiful vibe. And I would, you know, it's like, regardless what the the fanciness level or whatever, it's just the people. And then the last one that we just went to on Sunday was also really beautiful. Like everybody loved them. And, um, and it's just like the love and that community. It's something that I feel like we should have every day that just like celebration, that love and, and having those kind of parties. But, we don't. It's very rare, and we're so individualized, right? So um, it just wh- th- that day, that very expensive day, is a beautiful reminder of. Uh, I feel like what normal life should be in having these, you know, beautiful celebrations. So. That's a very refreshing take because a lot of people that I know that second shoot, they don't. It's more of like a a stepping stone into getting their own business started or or something like that but hearing you speak on like how precious these moments are is it's pretty refreshing i don't work i don't work for money and and here's the thing uh i honestly believe rebecca rebecca's fees are a lot lower uh i'm not saying that that's going to be like what she does but we can do like we have the opportunity and we have the ability to be able to give things at you know a more economical cost because it is wildly expensive. But I will say that for me doing these like photo shoots, I never hesitate to help because first of all, I get to eat their food, right? That's number one. Secondly, and the food is like, oh, come on. It's like, it's not going to be cheap typically. Um, but secondly, just to be a part of that celebration is amazing. So I, I love doing it. Even if they are honestly, if we had to do it for free, I don't do the editing. So like I, you know, it's not that much work for me, but to be able to be a part, I'm, I'm super, I love it, you know, and I have my own job, right? Obviously, but these are things that I, I love to do. So photos by Pearl, right? Photos by Pearl, Instagram. I, I don't want my wife coming out as like a cheap photographer, videographer. That's not the point. Um, but I do know that she, like, that is one of the ways we want to be a blessing, right? It's just to have a, um, not, you know, charge an arm and a leg. Now, I, I, I own rentals. I don't charge fair market value because I can. And I wanted to be able to do that. So it's incredible, man. Um, so could you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Like, where did you grow up? Um, yeah, sure. Um, and there's a lot to that. Very briefly, I, I grew up in Washington. I grew up in uh, everyone says Seattle, Washington, but I grew up in Edmonds pretty much most of my life. And, um, you know, I had a 
grew up in a loving family, two parents, uh, and I had a brother, which is another part of the story, right? Like I uh, just had a normal childhood growing up. Um, unfortunately, of course, my brother passed away, and I think you know that. You know my brother. Uh, brother passed away, which kind of changed the trajectory of like our family and then my life as well. Um, I was double major in college, and I completely stopped that literally right before my last quarter. I know that sounds crazy, but I had to take over my brother's business, which I then I got into real estate, which was a complete left field type of thing for me because I never wanted to become a realtor. Like that was the last thing on my mind because my dad was a realtor. I didn't want to have that life. Um, so yeah, that, that that's it's a normal childhood, but you know, it kind of took a, a lot of turns. What would you say some of your favorite memories as a child were? You know, I say this now because I don't have my brother anymore, but my favorite memories were honestly with him. Like, I think about the times we made, like, a snowman together, or I think about, and I think about this often because, like, of course, I, you know, you think about him a lot now that he's gone, but uh, I think about, like, the time he played uh, Mario RPG, if you remember that game. You're younger than me. Yeah, it's an older game. And then he would play Mario RPG and I would just watch him play games for hours. Um, And just being, yeah, just being able to play with them. Um, And as you probably know, because I think you've known me, like I was also a pretty wild kid. So just being able to be uh, uninhibited and just being myself and causing all types of trouble was always fun for me. What kind of impact would you say you're, brother had on your life he he had a he had a big i would say a big impact on various things for one he got me to god so that was one of the biggest things for me the thing that changed my life was my um like him because i became an atheist i didn't believe in god you you couldn't convince me to become a Christian, right? Because I thought it was just the opiate of the masses, people needing a crutch to survive in life. And what he showed me was that he had something that I know I didn't have, right? So I walked away from God because I was like, no, oh, this is all you know, BS. But he showed me that like a true, genuine love and like that joy that I, I knew I couldn't get by doing anything. And so he exemplified a life of love, kindness, um, like gentleness, like kind of all the fruits of the spirits. Like I saw that in him, which made me want to become more like that. So I would say like the introduction to God, actually I became a, I became a Christian because definitely because of him. Cause I was like, why not? The worst thing that's going to happen is God's not real and I become more like him. And then now I genuinely believe that there is a God. Uh, So that's one. And then uh, um, just in terms of business, he got me into business. Um, I feel like he kind of prepared the way for me to become an entrepreneur, um, for me to get into real estate. And not only that, he also got me into music. Um, He got me into, you know, various hobbies and, and interests like MMA and um, and things of that nature. So he had a huge influence. In fact, I'm into a lot of things my brother was into now. So, yeah. Could you describe your work? What, what do you do for work? Uh, so my main job is I am in real estate. So I did... Where I, I, I broker buyers and sellers for homes. That's how I got started in 2013. Um, I'm continuing to do that business. I've also gone to commercial real estate as well. I uh, now, A part of what I do is now like I own real estate. I have uh, about 40 properties that I'm managing one of those I guess, portfolios. And then my business partner is managing another one that we both own together. And then we're continuing to buy more 
we're, we're, we're going to continue to buy more. In fact, we almost put an offer on another one. Um, and then the other thing I'm now starting is uh, starting a Montessori school, uh, which if I don't know if you know the Montessori. I didn't know that you're, you're starting one. Yeah. And, and I'm not just saying like, oh, we're starting like we legitimately are starting one. It's going to be happening with a business partner of mine that runs a successful Montessori school. So it's just branching out from just a normal real estate to doing various things just because I, I'm able to now with a little bit more bandwidth. What is a Montessori school? It's basically a very specialized education. It's almost like a higher education for like pre-K. Like um, it's like kind of like a daycare, but it's a daycare that really teaches kids how to um, how, like, like just instructing them and training them on various, uh, I guess, things you're going to need in life, like potty training or something like that, or even teaching them how to speak Korean when they're in America. Um, among various other skills that um, you just don't get in your traditional pre-K schools. What would you say the inspiration for this venture is? Because that seems like a pretty big task. It is a big task, especially when you're dealing with kids. Inspiration comes from my, um, I guess, un disdain or unhappiness of how our education system is. Obviously, this is dealing with a lot younger kids, um, but I think this is going to be a start to uh, actually be involved in in education in schools. That actually is some of my uh, my life aspirations is to help influence schools in a very like a, a more positive way. What I mean by that is to help schools teach kids things in life that we really should be learning. For example, financial education. It's something that I feel like we don't, we don't learn in schools um, that I feel like is vital for anybody. People you and I, like you and I, we, we didn't learn financial education in schools. Uh, maybe you did. Most, most don't. And it's very frustrating because now that I've, I've had a lot of wealthy mentors teach me about how money works and I get, I actually get angry at the fact that I wasn't trained on so many different aspects about finances. That's one example. There's obviously many more like for like social skills. I honestly, I, I mean, I know you saw me, I may have seemed affable in among others at church, but at school I was actually kind of shy. Like I struggled to connect with other people, especially because I was one of the only Asian kids in school. And so, but I never was taught social skills. Like I thought, oh, I need to know a bunch of things in order to be sociable. Where now that I'm older, I realize, oh, I actually just have to be a really good listener to really connect with people. So that's where my inspiration came from. It's like just, I created a whole curriculum. It's called Baby Steps Curriculum. And in these curriculum like points, there's a lot of things that I feel like kids should be learning if from a young age. Like you don't even have to be, old to learn this stuff you said earlier you took over your brother's business right yeah what what was that like in terms of jumping in because your brother ran a very successful business what what kind of skills like did you have to learn right away or like how, how did you kind of navigate through that process it was not easy it was really hard like people I never showed a lot of hardship, but it was very, very hard for me to transition uh, into that. So I think I was like 22 years old I think when my brother passed away. So I had to take over a real estate business that I had no, I, I had no clue how to, how to do, right? So brother, he was actually running a successful business. So that did help a lot. I just didn't really know how to run it. like his business was to be an expert on short sales and uh, foreclosures and things like that. I did not know anything about short sales, foreclosures or real estate. So what I had to do was I had to, first of all, learn the business. And then I remember even just cause my, my brother had business partners. Um, I mean, I didn't even have like nice suits or anything. I, I think I had like black jean pants. That was like the fanciest thing I had. And then I had 
like a really big white shirt, right? It's my only collar shirt that I had. And I would just walk in there and I would just be like almost kind of pretending to be an adult, essentially, right? And so I had a lot of hardships. It, it wasn't easy for me to go into something that I really didn't know about. And then I basically just had to pretend to be like, pretend to know that I knew something, like, like pretend to be someone, right? To show confidence so they don't take advantage of me, right? And so I would say that's, that was like a really hard part at the same time. I'm, and I'll, I'll be super vulnerable, right? About how this all went about at the same time. Uh, fortunately, my brother did have savings. Like he was actually successful and he was making money. I didn't, we didn't have any, like there was a lot of expenses that we had to deal with and we didn't know how to deal with money. I, I didn't know how to deal with money. So the money that my brother had literally was gone like that. Like, and there's just a lot of expenses in life. Um, if I can, it, it was one of the greatest lessons of my life because it showed me that budgeting is for everybody, one, not 99%, 100% of everybody. So I, I, learned, I got so broke that I couldn't even put gas in my car. Like I, I had only, like, I had to put, you know, you put like $10 at a time. I had to do that. I couldn't even go full gas tank. Oh. So, so the transition was tough in that I had to learn this business and act like I knew how to do this business while we were struggling financially, right? Um, while I'm also trying to grieve my brother. So it's difficult to grieve your brother and try to do all this. And when I say struggling financially, I don't think what a lot of people know is like, we didn't have lights in our house. Like the electricity would be off and we'd be walking around with candles. See, people don't know that, right? Like I also had to have, uh, um, like I remember I would be mid shampooing and we wouldn't pay our water bills because we didn't have the money to. So I'd be in mid shampoo and all of a sudden the water would go off. And then my, like my dad, he knew what happened. My, my dad was in emotional distress. He just lost his son. He, he doesn't want to, he, he's not thinking about work or he's not thinking about anything else. He would walk into, like he would just literally walk into the bathroom and like kind of pretend like he didn't know what was going on, but he knew what was going on. And I remember I had like shampoo in my hair and he, like I would open like up on what's going on and you could just see like, you could just see his face, right? Like you could see the, the shame that he has that he couldn't provide for his family, you know, and, and he, you know, and I had no water. So I literally had to like towel dry my shampooed hair and, and, and there's a little trick for anybody who wants, but literally like my dad went out cause they came in and they turned off the water and my dad went out after the guy left. It was at night and he literally manually turned on the water, like illegally and manually turned on the water just so I can, you know, like we t still had water. My grandparents were living with us. My mom was still there and like, we were all there. So all that to say is like the transition was very difficult because I had to try to learn a new business while I was in, especially in entrepreneurship, it's so difficult because you don't have a guaranteed income. And that's why most people don't do it and why most people fail. Um, so yeah, that was, that was uh, one of the toughest parts. What do you think made you successful in terms of sticking to it because i hear a lot about entrepreneurship online and through some people that i know and they just people can't seem to stick it through at times and what what really made you like be able to stick it through to the end i'm gonna say number one, i mean seriously god took me through the end um i wholeheartedly believe in that he gave me the strength to continue like pushing when I had failure after failure after failure. Beyond that, um, it really is like you just, I was, I was, I had no other choice. I was so desperate. I had to keep going there. There's no, there's no turn off button. There's no reset button in life. 
you know, like, you know, when we, the, one of the biggest deceptions of playing video games is that when you're playing an RPG, you could always like restart your character or do something. You could restart, you die, you restart the character, you know, everything restarts. The problem with life is you cannot do that. And what a lot of people I see do is rather than dealing, facing reality, they, they simply just run away into vices. Vices being Netflix, their phone, video games is a huge one for men. Um, smoking weed, drinking, going to parties or whatever. Like that's what people do to run away. Uh, I'm not going to say that I was perfect in that, in that like I, I also, you know, when I had a failure, I had to, I had to cope some way. So I'll be honest, like I used to, I used to like, you know, I either watch a movie or drink or do something to kind of like deal with the pain. But then the next day after I got up, I would kind of reset myself, say, this is a new day whatever happened yesterday happened and I just got to keep going. So it was really out of desperation and I just reset myself every day, just mentally. And then I just gave it my best, um, the next day. So for a lot of entrepreneurs, one of the beauties about one of the beautiful things about being an entrepreneur is that it, te it grows you as a person. I wholeheartedly believe that your income level will never exceed your personal development level. It's a Jim Rohn qu quote. And I think the reason why I'm continuing to make more money than I did before is because I, my, my character has elevated. You know what I'm saying? And that's what's going to get you to that success line. Because a, a man who has really good character will become successful in anything that he does. That's the truth. Like if he has good character, he has integrity. He, he's a make it happen type of person. Not no, he, he doesn't make excuses. He doesn't complain. And he just, he keeps his promise. Like he will become successful in anything. And I would say that's what helped me a lot is that like I, my, my character developed and so did my income and so did my job and everything else. So you had, a season when you took over your brother's business of almost forced character development, you were put in that situation and you had to grow from it. Right. Yeah. What do you do now that's intentional for your character development? I, I want to say hardship hardships are, are one of the greatest, most painful, but one of the greatest things in someone's life, as long as it doesn't break them. So as long as you're not broken, it will be the biggest accelerator of your character development. Uh, and then of course you learn from things. Now, how do I continue to you know develop? Um, dude, the people around you are so important. The books that you read, the people you're subscribed to on YouTube, like obviously you, people want to subscribe to you because you're helping people with their character, right? Hopefully, yeah. You are. And, and, and you have to surround yourself with the right people. There are people that I have had to cut, cut in my life, get rid of because they're developed. Like they just, they won't grow. They continue complaining in life, blaming everybody else for their problems. And those guys are, and, and then also they're the, the, I told you sowers. I don't like, I told you sowers, the people who like, just cause you made a mistake, you tried something, you made a mistake. And then they're like, I told you, make you feel bad about it. Those aren't, that's not a millionaire mindset. You know what I'm saying? And so what I do is I watch who I hang out with very carefully. I limit who I hang out with very carefully. Now there's times where I, you know, I go to the marginalized, I go to people who are struggling and things like that. And that's, that's a different type of community that I build. Uh, and, but that's intentional, right? But for my core community, I'm very careful and I'm constantly watching good YouTube. That's the modern way. It's good YouTube videos of people that you want to become like. You don't want to follow people you don't want to become like. Do I follow Jake Paul? Logan Paul? Heck no, dude. Like, I don't want to be, be anything like those kids. Yeah, they have more money than me, but I don't want their lives. I don't want to become like them. So I would say you, YouTube's a huge one. Uh, and then, of course, the books you read. You know, there's so much wisdom in the books that you read. And it'll grow you significantly. I make it a 
intentional effort for me to um like for example marriage right i think we i think me and rebecca have an amazing marriage i read four books on marriage before i got married i've also inquired on many of my uh the, the mentors that i've i've wanted to become like like i see their marriage i'm like i want your marriage and i got so much wisdom from them and with all of that and you know, I'm not saying it's just me because honestly, Rebecca is, um, she is an amazing wife. So I do have that, like, you know, I have that advantage, but at the same time, I do know that a lot of these books that I've read really helped me to have a good marriage. You've been married for almost two years now. Yeah. Yeah. What have, congrats, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what have been some things that surprised you about marriage that you didn't expect while you were single? I thought it was going to be a lot worse than it, it, it is now. What do you I, mean by that? It's like uh, seeing a 50% on Rotten Tomatoes, and then you go and watch the movie. You're like, oh, my gosh, this is like an amazing movie. That's a great analogy. <laughs> but it's it really, it's, it's just like, because, you know, dude, I've seen a lot of marriages struggle. You watch on TV, and you see all these, like, you know, because they only put on the dramatic ones, right? I've seen a lot of marriages fail. Uh, unfortunately i've seen a lot of divorces and it's just not a um, it's not a pretty sight but so i have actually very low expectations going into marriage but i will say one of the biggest surprises is that marriage is wonderful and i have to tell the people and we're we're not married that long i get that but i do believe that marriage can be super wonderful you do have to be intentional. You do have to work at it. You have to get counselors and wisdom and do all. You have to uh, put in the work. But when you get there, I honestly believe marriage can be so, so good and so fun and so beautiful in many ways. Um, so that would be the surprise. Do you have any advice for single people and what do you think stewarding singleness faithfully means? I was 32 years old when I got with my wife or, um, you know, now wife, right? So I have experienced singleness uh, to for a pretty long time. I'm not saying that 32 is old. Like, seriously, you can get married later, uh, and that's totally fine. That's kind of what it is nowadays. Um I want to say that you like the partner that you have is not going to change. Like that's not going to be your end all be all that thing that makes you happy. And I, um, I, I, I want to be a little bit more, uh, I guess harder to the men. I don't know who, who, who watches your stuff. I, I just, I'm going to talk more to the men, uh, when it comes to marriage. And one of the things that I did, prepare, another reason why I feel like things are going really smoothly is because, I did prepare myself uh, in many ways to have this moment of marriage. Let me give you a concrete example, money. So I watch a bunch of dating shows now. I'm into them. I'm so lost into them. I'm watching Married at First Sight. I'm watching, uh, 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 what do you call it, um, Ultimatum, et cetera, you name it. Like I watch all of them, right? All the Korean ones, all the American ones, I'm watching them because of Rebecca. And one of the biggest concerns for a lot of men is that they're afraid of their finances. They are afraid of their finances. Um, they don't want to get married, like especially in ultimatum. A lot of the men, the reason why they're not getting married is because they're just not, they don't feel like they're like ready financially, right? Um, I'm not going to say that you shouldn't get married because you're just like, because you don't maybe have as much as you, you wished you have. But I will say it is important and it is vital because most marriages fail because of finances. And that's, that, that is 100, like that's statistics, right? If you, if you just look it up, finances are, finances are really important. I feel like the, the men, even though you may not make that much, what you can do well is you can work on your budget. You can work on your money control because one of the things that my mentors ta taught me is that if you don't control your money, you're not going to have any. If you're, if you're not like, if you don't have a plan for your money, 
your money's gonna they he said your money's gonna run away from you and it happens every single time i've made multiple six-figure months but i would have no money and what i've realized is it's because i didn't have a plan for money as soon as i started having a plan for money all of a sudden i start to have more i'm like oh that was the biggest lesson that I learned. So I think for men, I really feel like they need to, um, that is one part of it. You have to work on your character and you need to work on your finances, have a budget, get used to doing a budget. It's going to take you years to get good at it, but at least have one and stick to it. Learn how to stick to it. Get creative about finances, eat beans and rice. I don't care what it takes. Don't ever go out, go out once a year. Cause that's the stuff that I did. Um, do whatever it takes and then it's going to pay dividends in the future when you're married. I hope that's like practical advice as practical as I can get. Yeah, I think that was great. I, so failed marriages because of finances, is it centered around the couple's behavior for that money? It's because it almost sounds like it's not because it's a lack of, but because of how they're using it, maybe? Most people, okay, this is gonna be a bit controversial, but I'm also a big Dave Ramsey fan. Uh, Dave Ramsey is a financial guru that, um, this is his philosophy. It, it's most of the time, I'm not gonna put a, put a percentage, but it's a high percentage. Most of the time, it's a problem with money management than actually having the income for it, right? Um, what I, okay. What I mean by that, okay. It could be an income problem. Don't get me wrong. Um, it could be an income problem, but that's also a money management problem too. So like, if you don't have enough, if you, if you have done the budget and you're like sticking to it, you're eating beans and right, you're doing everything right. But you still don't have enough income to be able to save and invest and do all those things. Then you do by doing that first step, then you're going to understand how to, then you got to get, then you got to make more money. You got to get a second job. You got to rob people. I don't know. Like I'm joking, obviously, but you got to do what it, you got to get super creative in bringing in that extra money. Um, and that's what's like, you won't know how to do that until you do that first step. So I would say it's a money management problem more than an income problem for a lot of people. And I, I don't feel like people, like, again, it could be discouraging. I get it. Like, I understand people are really struggling 100%. I think just to encourage people rather than, because I feel like what a lot of people do, uh, but by the way, I've been doing a lot of financial coaching recently, just a very uh, free, of course. Like, I do it for free. And I just help people. Um, I think a lot of people, what they do is rather than tackling the problem and really like understanding the reality of the problem, like, oh, I have credit card debt, I have student loan debt, I have this and that, like I'm not paying it off and I'm not managing this well. Rather than actually dealing with that, what people do is they run away from that reality. They run away into vices like, again, Netflix, shows, binge watching, partying, drinking, or whatever it is, right, Instagram. And those vices become so much more powerful and pulling because your reality sucks. So you see, like, because you're not dealing with this, you you just go here. But then the problem is when you go here, this thing gets even worse. And then this pull and temptation gets even stronger. And so what people have to do is literally cut this out completely. And that's what I did personally and just tackle it. And to tackle it, you got to probably get a friend to help you who knows how to do this stuff. And then you got to like have a plan and you got to stick with the plan. So having that friend was really beneficial for keeping you accountable to it. But was there like a point where you, you just kind of knew within yourself, like there's no turning back here with your behavior in terms of, cutting out these vices and like sticking to the plan the the temptation to go back to the vices are always going to be there um, but it gets wildly easier later because it takes 66 days to build a habit right once you habituate a behavior 
it would become significant. So I believe in um, like uh, the neural pathways, right? And so, you know, like I don't want to get too scientific, but essentially like I, I feel like when you do a behavior, like um, when I scratch my belly, my, I, my nose gets itchy or something like that, right? And the more you do it, the more that neural pathway gets stronger. It's like taking a road and it just gets easier to go through that road every time you do that same behavior, right? And so it can go in a bad way. So like, for example, if you're an alcoholic or if you have struggle with weight and you have snacks all around the house and your go to your like auto auto mode is you come home and you see snacks, you go for the snacks, you eat the snacks and you feel bad, right? Rather than going to the gym, something like that. Well, the more you do that, that habit is just going to become stronger. That's why people sometimes have to move or have a completely different environment to change their behavior. But at, at the same time, if you do the good habits and you keep doing those good habits over and over and over again, that behavior will become significantly more stronger and it'll be so much easier for that neural pathway to, you know, like for you to go through that pathway. It's stronger. And then it gets to the point where you don't even think about it. You know, some of your friends are like, yeah, I don't even think about working out. I just go to the gym. It's not like they start, they started like that. They just built that neural pathway so strong that it became such a strong habit. See what I'm saying? So it def, it definitely does um, get easier and the temptations definitely reduce in terms of like how strong the pull is. What do you prioritize now in your 30s versus when you're in your 20s? And this could be in the realm of health, emotional health as well. Um, and just maybe like things that you just value now that you didn't before in your 20s. I, I want to say definitely health is a huge thing. What I didn't realize in my 20s is because I thought I was invincible in my 20s, that I can eat whatever I want, I can stay up however long I want, I can whatever, however long, you know, do all these bad habits and I could still survive because I'm strong. And that's what it's like, oh yeah, I slept like three hours and I'm totally like going. That's dumb because science tells you something different. And science now tells you, you need to sleep eight hours a day. So one of the things that I really learned is that, first of all, you need to sleep eight hours. Like if you don't sleep eight hours, you're not resetting the body to be able to function the way, if you're wondering why you're so tired and fatigued, it's because you're not sleeping properly. And so one of the things that I now do in my thirties is I protect my sleep like my baby, right? I also protect what I eat like my baby in the sense that I used to be able to eat sugar, junk food, soda, all those things, and still be able to function. You can't afford that when you're in your 30s. When you're in your 30s, you have to really focus on what goes inside the body because that's going to manifest in your ability to do anything. Like if you're like, I want to become a successful entrepreneur. Well, you're probably not going to get there if you're not, focusing on the thing that gives you the energy to be able to do what you need to do. If that makes sense. Now there are those people who do eat junk food and still like are able to be so obsessive into something that they still survive. But for the 95% of the rest of the people who are normal, like, yeah, you should probably focus on your health. So that is one thing I, I, that I do focus on in my thirties. So what does a typical day look like for you? Like from when you wake up, what, what kind of habits do you kind of implement in your daily life? I would say mornings, I, I get up and I kind of like, I obviously like take a shower and kind of get myself prepared, kind of like get a fresh new day. I wash my face um, just to kind of prepare. And then I always like, seriously, I'm not exaggerating every single day. I get up and I, 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 I read two devotionals, two separate devotionals. Um, and, or sometimes I'll, I'll just read the Bible. Why too? Because it's not enough. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but it's like uh, one of the devotionals, it's like, it'll take me five minutes to get done. It's, it's just not enough for me. I want to spend more time with the Lord and I have so much to do. So many emails to get, 
but that's the one time that I make sure that I, you got to be intent. Another thing in your thirties, you got to be more intentional because time isn't as plentiful as it was in your twenties. So you got to be super f- intentional and in, intentional ab- about everything you do in your life. I'm intentional about spending time with God. So in the mornings, that's what I do. And then I spend time with my wife, you know, for a little bit talk. We sometimes do devotionals together and then we, uh, um, talk about what we learn and then we pray. Sometimes I do walk with, uh, my wife, uh, take the dog out and we just, you know, go walking. Um, I go to work, I do my thing, make like a thousand phone calls, do everything I can go on meetings, et cetera, et cetera. I come home and three days out of the week, I'm working out. I wish I could say five days, but I'm just, I have to be super practical with my life. Five days. I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing not to do that because three days a week and that should be enough for me to continue. So I do work out, come home. I eat together uh, with my wife, whether it's, you know, we try to eat without the TV. Sometimes we watch dating shows or whatever. Um, and then we, um, kind of wind down for the night and then we, um, we walk our dog together, spend that time again intentionally to talk things through, talk about our days, just tons of communication. Um, and then I, and then I go to sleep. It's not, I don't know if you're looking for something like really fancy. The thing is like a lot of people who are like doing things at a high level don't live like super, they think they live like super exciting lives. No, we don't really have that. It's actually pretty mundane. <laughs> no, the reason so. why I asked that question was to demystify that not everyone lives this Instagram life. Like yes. we we make our lives the way that is most optimal for us. And for you, your time with your wife is super valuable. So that's why you make that time to spend time with her as well as working out, walking the dog. You know, it's, I just want people to know that like everyone has a different lifestyle that works for them. And just because you see something on Instagram doesn't mean your life has to be that way, especially if you're like an entrepreneur. Can I just comment on that? Instagram is one of the most deceptive things about, I I would say one of the most deceptive things about uh, success and life and things like that, because a lot of, I know a lot of influencers. Um, I know some very successful influencers and that I think a lot of them do portray a certain type of life. Like, Oh, I go out all the time and do all those things. Um, but that's not a life of a successful person a lot of the time, most of the time, honestly, it's not the life because a successful person, most of them live very boring lives. Um, and I know it because I know a lot of, okay, I'm going to talk just in terms of financial, just because it's the easiest way to, I, I guess, for definition wise, like I know a lot of millionaires and those millionaires don't drive fancy cars. They're the ones who are driving the Honda Accords, the camera Camrys. They're driving very mundane, very non-fancy cars. Um, they're not out eating out at super nice, fancy restaurants all the time, you know? I'm not saying that that's bad, but I'm talking like the really fancy restaurants, like $200 a meal type of, I'm telling you six, a lot of successful people do not eat at those restaurants. They save their money. They eat at home and every once in a while they go eat out. But most of the time, that's why I'm saying it's kind of like a deception that they think like, Oh, you know, look at all the things that I'm doing. And sometimes by the clout, like by the Instagram followers, then they can get brand deals and they can actually become successful. And that is one way I just wholeheartedly disagree with that lifestyle. And the very, very few actually become successful that way. But a lot of people go and pursue it through that route. And they obviously fail because they don't have enough money and they're just trying to live a lifestyle that is that's that's not what actually successful people live out so what's next for you in the next six months to a year what's on the docket i'm i i, I want to have kids i am going to continue on this montessori i'll have bought another mobile home park i'm a big mobile home park guy i believe in the uh, investment um 
I'll have bought another mobile home park. I'll have finished a draft of my, I have a book that I'm making. I'll finish a draft of that book. I will have started hopefully like multiple of these Montessori schools because this is just the first one. We're going to do several of them. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, just be, have a better, closer relationship with God. I mean, that's, everything else can go away. That's the only thing that really matters for me. So. Is there anything that you'd want to tell your younger self when you're 18? Oh, that's a good one. I would say find a mentor. Find a good mentor. Uh, it's going to make the biggest difference in your life. Put good people around you. Cut off the people who are not good for your life. What, what I mean by that is like, like cut off the people who are poison in your life. And you can clearly tell by some of their, like the people that I told you so people or the people who like make fun of you always cut you down. Um, the people who are, or like they're, you know, those kind of people, I would say be careful of the people you are around because you're going to become like the people you are around. If you're around like, again, I'm going to go financial, sorry, but it's like, if you're around five millionaires, you'll be a millionaire. I believe in it. I've always surrounded myself with like, I surrounded myself with like really successful people, like nine figures, you know, and that really helped me think because they think differently. And the what change was not necessary because we are always like so focused on what am I going to do for my career? How am I going to plan to do this? How am I going to like, what, what, what am I going to do? But they don't focus on their character and their mindset. I'm saying focus on your, at 18, like focus on your character and mindset and things will start happening for you. Opportunities will arise and you will take them and you'll just grow. Focus on the character, get good people around you. Thank you for your time, Peter. It was really good having you on. Yeah, thanks for having me.